really am excited by the possibilities now and the way things are going. I think that there's never been a better time for a third voice or a fourth voice to be registered on the federal level for president of the United States. And it's a perfect storm for the way things are going. I was recently in Egypt, I was recently in Vietnam, and I actually was recently in Italy, so I've been traveling a bit to the beginning of this year. And I was literally stopped on the street by people, I guess I look American, and they're saying, what's going on in the United States? Are you seriously considering voting for that Republican Trump? I mean, they're, they're, they're scared, and they have a right to be scared. We need to get our message out. We are in the mainstream of American political thought. We are financially responsible. We are socially accepting. We believe in responsibility, and we believe in liberty and choice. And it's a misnomer that we are kind of conservative Republicans. I mean, we're classic, classic conservatives, but we're also classic liberals. And we have to get that word out. I don't know how many of you have taken, gone to this website called isidewith.com. Letter I, side with dot com. It's really interesting. You answer something in the order of 25 questions, and then you also weight them as to how important those particular questions are to you. Vote the submit button, and uh, then it will tell you which presidential candidate you are most closely aligned with. And I did it. I've only done it once, but I came in actually in the 90 percent of the first three libertarian candidates was where I sided with. Do you know who the, the next one was? Bernie Sanders. 69%. And if you weed away anything dealing with finances and fiscal responsibility, which we're completely at odds with, but we are really close. We need to get this word out. And the most important issue from my standpoint that will affect people, will affect our country, will affect what we want to happen is school choice. We don't have an understanding around the country as to what that means. But if you look at it, we have competition in computers and cell phones and toothpicks and automobiles. And what happens as a result of that? We get good quality products for reduced for competitive prices. It works, no question about it. Why don't we use competition with regard to something even more important than that is schools? So I tell people, in fact, on the campaign in 2012, it's somewhat embarrassing, but I was going through this school choice issue. I was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and as I was launching into it, getting all enthusiastic, people were kind of, no, Judge Greg, wait, we don't have any bad schools anymore in Milwaukee. We've had school choice now for five years, and of course now this is four years later. It works. So what you say is it empowers parents to choose where the government money will be spent for the education of their children. And you know what? They will demand excellence. Wouldn't you? Of course you would. And you know what else? You demand excellence, you'll receive it. So you do me a favor, and I have the gray school, be it public or private, and you, I'm failing, I'm not doing a good job for your children. Maybe you'll do me the favor of coming in and saying, come on, Gray, get it together. You've got to educate my child in, in such and such a way, or I'm gonna take my child over to a competing school. And they will, and if they start voting with their feet and taking my customers start going somewhere else, what's gonna happen? One of two things. Either I'm gonna get better, or I'm gonna go out of business, to which I say, good, good. Both of those are good results. And then if I go out of business, some other entrepreneur will come in and take my facility and make it better. Now, not everyone in the world needs to be a PhD in philosophy or go into law or go into economics. It's great if they do and they have that choice, but why not vocational schools? Why not getting people skills? Skills work. It makes you marketable because people that have skills have place that they're marketable. Germany does this extremely well. Hey, last I looked, Germany's economic growth, economics is doing quite well because they have vocational schools. My child loves computers. In fact, one of my sons I adopted from Vietnam. In fact, that's why I was in Vietnam. I took him 
back for the first time. He was finally interested in coming back to New York before I found him and stuff. It was really an emotional experience. But he graduated from high school and tried a couple of junior colleges and stuff. He's just not interested particularly in formal education. But he was certified by Microsoft. He is a computer wizard. Wonderful. He's doing quite well, thank you very much. And he got the education that he needed. And you can take your child to whatever school is appropriate. Competition works. Now look, if you are in a formal, and I, I'm a product of public schools. I love public schools in a lot of ways. I went through public schools, through high school, and UCLA thereafter. So I don't want to do anything that's going to injure public schools per se. Now, back in 1992, as a sitting trial court judge in California, I have seen from my own experience that our nation's drug war was not working. So I did something very unusual for a sitting trial court judge, and I hold press conferences and speaking about this ever since as to why our system has to be better. But as a result of that, in 1993, I met Milton Friedman. We went up to the Hoover Institute and had a group that uh, was about 40 of us or so to rally. We put together a resolution on drug policy, and I ran this meeting. But at an intermission or a recess, I saw Dr. Friedman talking around. He was talking about school choice. And it was intriguing that I'd never really thought about it before, never heard about it before. But I said, Dr. Friedman, you know, I'm a product of public schools. I really appreciate public schools. I don't want to undercut them. He said, Jim, I'm going to ask you two questions. Question number one is, if you are a parent of a college-age child, where in the world do you want your child to go to get the best education that he or she can get? And I said, you know, I'm not sure, but probably the United States of America. He said, I think you're right. Question number two, if you are the parent of a high school-age child, where in the world do you want your child to go to get the best education that he or she can? And I said, I'm not really sure, but probably not the United States of America. He said, you're right again. Why? Because you can choose where your money is going to be spent for university, for college. You cannot choose in high school. From that moment, I've been involved with school choice. It's the right way to go. Please, any questions along the way? Yes. Cases about the land amendments in the states and the fact that they are blocking these school choice programs yes. within the states. Yes. Yes. The question is, am I aware of various cases around the country, in various states, blocking school choice? Look, we are talking huge amounts of power and huge amounts of money here. I'm going to answer your question, but this way. We have to make a decision as a country. What is the purpose of our school system? Number one, to educate our children? Hmm, what a novel concept. Or number two, to promote and protect below average teachers. And guess what we're doing today? And you see these ads, oh, give more money to the schools, it's for the children, and that's a crock. It's not for the children, it's for the teachers' unions. And so the teachers' unions are funding these various attacks in the legal system against school choice. We are being more successful. Yes, of course, we're challenging, we're, as we said in law school, we're, off, we're goring their ox, or we're oxing their gore, whatever, or alanning them, never mind. Um, <laughs> but of course we're going to expect these challenges. When it comes down to it, we've already decided this issue. It is not a question of separation of church and state. We've already decided it by veterans benefits, folks. If you are in the military, you're entitled to GI benefits, GI education. And then, if you want to go to Sisters of Mercy College or Trinity or whatever, you can. It's not, you're not spending government money. You're spending your, it's your choice where that money is going to be spent. So when it comes down to it, fundamentally, that issue has been decided. And if people see it in that fashion, they will. But of course, there's a lot of money behind this, and some of the challenges are successful. But according to the Friedman Foundation, which I belong to, fewer and fewer of these cases challenging this are, accept, are, are being successful. Well, what do we do about the state, the state amendments that actually prohibited, according to some state, yeah. uh, the Supreme Court, and so on? Okay, the 
question is, what do we do about some of these amendments to the constitutions or whatever that prohibit it? Uh, you know, I believe in the concept of federalism. We're not going to be successful around the country all at once, but you start with various places and then you watch us improving. And that's what's happening. You know, Wisconsin is doing well. Indiana now is doing well. There were, there were uh, challenges here in Florida, and for a while they were successful. Uh, now they're not. Now we are making progress in Florida, I believe, with regard to this issue. Unfortunately, because of politics, the word school voucher is, has negative connotations. And uh, so I don't care what term you use. Now it says educational school, I'm sorry, educational savings account, ESA. Uh, call it that. Call it a, a charter school. Call it a coupon. Call it a scholarship. I don't care what you call it. That's the result. You empower parents to choose where their child will get his or her education. Yes? So they can rise to that level. 
And to some degree, that's a good idea, and to some degree, it isn't, because the people that are, we're now failing a lot of our students who are really high achievers, and then they get bored to tears when they're in school because, you know, they have to spend all this time on those that aren't quite so, so high up. So that's a problem. Let the parents decide. Let the parents do that. You got a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so I don't have that. I'll just let it rest. But I guess the thing is, so I agree a thousand percent with everything you're saying. Nobody, Nobody saying. agrees a thousand percent. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, my hardest question, you know, that that you know that I can't answer, and people, you know, are, are going to be asking you. Have, this works for for the vast majority of parents who care and kids who care. But honestly. My daughter is also a teacher on um, the other side of Manhattan, and um, that she uh, teaches in a school. She she left left after one year. They are very the school she was at the one year. Very very young dedicated teachers. It's not bad teachers. Honestly, it's kids who don't care who go home. To parents who don't care, and the kids who come to our school we ask them to leave. It's not because they have mental disabilities. Or English as a second language, everybody is English as a second language. It's, it's the kids who have behavioral issues who throw them into one kid pen, you, you cherry pick all the kids out who care, and you help those kids who care. We're helping the kids who care. And then the kids who are left are sinking lower. And it's and how do you address it's actually the parents and it's actually the, where they come from that they don't value school. So we just let those guys I'm glad you're here because these are real life problem questions. Yeah. Um, so what do you that okay. As as we say in my profession, in the legal profession, that's called a compound question. You've asked several questions there, and I'm going to try to. One problem people will focus on, and they're right. Okay, you are a caring parent. So you're going to be on where, and you're going to find the right school, etc. But there are parents who are too busy, who don't value it for whatever reason. Or I'm a farmer, and by the time my child reaches the age of 12, I want him to go out and pick grapes. I mean, I understand those problems are there. My response to that is, again, nothing is perfect. I can't do everything at once. But there's going to be a coattail effect here. So you care. You're a parent. You live next door to me. My, I don't care for whatever reason. I'm sorry. But my kids play with your kids. Okay? Now your kids go off to acne school. Hey, Dad, I want to go with your kids. There will be a coattail effect. And it doesn't take much because if you have a failing school that's now losing 10, 15 percent of their customers, they're going to look around saying, wait a minute, because there's, there's less revenue there. It's called competition. And there's less revenue there. It's going to get a response from them. It will. So just that amount of loan, and you're certainly going to have 15% caring parents in every school. And so it will have that effect. Again, nothing is perfect. Now, what do you do with regard to those kids that I have to be here, I don't want to be here, and if I have to, I'm going to ruin it for you too, which is kind of maybe only a slight exaggeration of what you're saying. What do you do with them? Well, you know, if there is competition there, and there are caring parents, uh, caring parents and certainly caring teachers. Or sometimes they get beat up because they just keep getting more and more of these, and, and I sympathize with that. But maybe really getting into social studies and getting into geography is not their thing, and they're bored. Okay, what is your what is your thing? What are you interested in? You know, I really like engines. I really like to fix electric motors, whatever it would be. Hey, have you ever thought of the internet? You know, you know what's out there? We can monitor. It will be addressed individually to each child because that's what competition does. So maybe you're interested in electric, but maybe you'd like to be an aircraft mechanic. We'll put you into a vocational school. You'll get some math, some arithmetic and math and all that sort of stuff there too. But if we can take away that boredom, and then, there, you know, I agree, there's some that we simply won't be able to reach, and there's going to be problems, but there'll be a lot fewer if you have it individualized. And individualization works because of profit motive, because of competition. It's exciting, but we have to get this word out 
Not to us libertarians, because we pretty much know that. But you're not going to get this, certainly from the Democrats, controlled by the teachers' unions. And I love teachers. But maybe some of them have been so beaten up that they, they've just stopped producing, and they know they can't be fired. If you look at public schools today, they are top heavy in administration. Every one of them. Look, I'm a good teacher, but I'm not dumb. I realize where the money is is administration. So I want to make more money, so I go into administration. The good teachers end up graduating out of the classrooms, and they're in administration, which, by the way, we have many too many in almost every public school. Private schools don't have that. Private schools actually have to be responsive, so their better teachers are actually in the classroom. Huh, what a novel concept. That's what we can do. That's what competition will accomplish. Again, in anything, you, you know, drug policy, whatever, you, healthcare, whatever you're gonna talk about, there's no such thing as a perfect system. I know that. But the idea, like in drug policy, you wanna find what the harms are and reduce the harms. What we do in education, we want to find out what the problems are and reduce those problems. And the way it will happen is to what? Empower, that's the word I use, empower the parents to choose where that money will be spent. And they will demand excellence. They will get it. It's exciting. How can we get this word out? There is a truth in elections. You cannot use elections to educate voters. You can't. It just doesn't work. But we're going to have to swim upstream or run uphill or whatever it is. We've got to get this word out and we've got to do it now. Parents do care. I was in Watsonville. You don't know where that is. It's on the Monterey Bay in California between Santa Cruz up here and Monterey down there. And Watsonville is an agrarian town. They have a lot of what do they raise? Artichokes, I mean, they raise all kinds of different stuff. And I was talking to a teacher from Watsonville in a public school. And she said, Jim, you know, it's really discouraging. So I show up, I teach the fifth grade. And September comes around and I have my new class. And I look at all these faces, and two thirds of my class do not speak English. They're nice kids, and so I start at the bottom, and I start trying to teach English, but I know a little Spanish, so I can egg them along, all of which is fine. And, and so I work with them. And of course, the other kids in my class are bored because they know him and all that sort of stuff. And so I work with them. And it comes December, it comes March. And finally then, a lot of them, by this time, the growing season is over. So they're gone. They leave. They move on someplace else. And I look around, and all of a sudden, now I have another third of my children to come in. And they're fresh freshly here, and they don't speak English. And it's just really hard. <clears throat> so eventually, you just kind of, what do I do? You know, it's exasperation. There's only so much, many times I can run into the wall. And so the teacher just starts wearing, getting worn out. We've got to find a better way. We've got to reward teachers for doing a good job. In this system, Good teachers will thrive, will thrive. Why? Because I have a school, and I have a really good teacher, and I'm just not paying them for enough money, OK? For whatever reason, I'm putting shackles on where they can't teach up to what the optimum level would be. Ah, uh, doggone it, you're an entrepreneur. And they start, you start saying, hey, come over to my school. I'll pay you more. I'll, I'll have fewer restrictions. Good teachers will be in demand. Good teachers will thrive under this circumstance. Other teachers that have been beaten up, that are really inherently good, but they've gotten lazy or whatever for whatever reason, will start flourishing again. And the poorer teachers will go out of work, to which I say, good. Now, what about the labor unions? What about the teachers unions? You don't need to worry about them, from my standpoint. Because if a school goes out of business, or a school changes hands, no one can keep a school from going out of business. And so the new school will be able to bring in new teachers. So there will be an incentive for teachers also. And we want that for the good teachers. We want that for all teachers. But some of them maybe shouldn't be there. And they will either get better or they will find
find another line of work. To which we all say, Amen. good. Okay? Nothing is perfect. But we libertarians are the message that to help your children get excellence in education. It will bring all kinds of new creativity, ingenuity. Today, most schools, to my knowledge, are not using the internet. How stupid. Why? Oh, because the teacher's a threat. Whatever the reason is, there's a lot of information. Some of it's good on the internet. Some of it's actually true on the internet. <laughs> okay? And there are ways that we can utilize this to actually individualize the education for all of our children. They can learn at their own level. They can find things that will interest them. They will find things that will open their eyes to the fact that, hey, life is interesting. I tell, I've organized something called Peer Court in the Orange County Schools in California, where we actually have real juvenile cases, criminal cases, screened out by the probation department, and they're brought to us, and then we go to different school districts, and we impanel the jury of high school students uh, who actually ask questions of the subject and the, uh, the subject's parents. Uh, it's amazing the questions that these high school jurors will ask, not only the subjects, but uh, parents, like, uh, what? You didn't know that your high school daughter was out at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday? What, you don't know who your child's friends are? Are you ashamed of your, of your friends? You don't want to show them you know, all this sort of stuff. So some of the teachers, excuse me, some of the parents get a revelation, which is actually your children want you to be a parent. There's a difference between being your child's friend and your child's parent. But at any rate, at this point, I look at some of these kids, because I'm a judge on a thing, and so they'll listen to me just a little bit. Mostly they'll listen to their peers. But I tell me, who are your friends? You show me your friends. I'll show you your future. Now, think just for a moment. Who are your three closest friends? Close your eyes. Close your eyes and think. Who are your three closest friends? You don't have to tell me who they are. Ten years from now, are they going to be successful or not? And chances are, if they ditch school or smoke marijuana or talk back to their teachers or their parents or whatever, that's what you're going to do too. In fact, I would go so far as to say there's no such thing as teen pre as peer pressure. There's no such thing. How many of you agree with me? And a couple of them maybe raise their hands and say, okay. I've got a, do you like money? Yeah. You want to earn some money? Sure, I want to earn some money. I've got a gun. And I actually know that over at the quarter 7 Eleven, they've got a lot of money now. I'm going to go over and, and hold them up. All you need to do is stand in the door and let me know if anybody's coming, okay? And I'll split the money with you. You're going to come? Oh, but come on, if you don't do that, I'm not going to be your friend anymore. You're going to come? No. You are the captain of your own ship. You are the one that makes decisions in your life. And you know what else? You're going to be responsible for the decisions you make. You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Ask another question. I recommend it to you. I do it all the time to my team, team court, whatever. How old are you? I'm 17. Okay, let me ask you a hard question. How old are you going to be 10 years from now? Only once have I had a student not get that right for Newport Harbor High School. Okay. okay, I'm going to be 27. All right. What do you want your life to look like 10 years from now? What do you want your life to be? Well, I want to go to a good college. Well, I want to be an engineer. All of those are good, commendable goals. What are you doing now? to achieve those goals. Is shoplifting from a department store going to help you achieve those goals? Is ditching school and smoking marijuana going to help you get those goals? Hey, you want to go to UCLA? You don't know this. I lied to them. You don't know this, but I'm a registrar at UCLA. Do you think I want a thief at my school? All of this is by way of, way of saying you are responsible for the choices you make. There's no such thing as peer pressure. You can take drugs, whether they're legal or illegal, is irrelevant as far as your body is concerned. You treat your body well, it will treat you well, and vice versa. Ask Janice Joplin or Jim Morrison or whatever. Okay? 
So all of these things, you get into the literal truth that choices matter in your life, in your students, in your children's lives. You look at somebody and say, okay, who wants you to get a good education? Well, my parents would, yes, that's true. And who else? Well, my family, yes. In fact, I want to also, I don't even know you particularly, but I want you to get a good education. Who else, young man? You probably don't even know her yet. Oh, someday if I get married. Yes, your wife is applauding you, is hoping it will affect her a great deal if you get a good education. Who else wants you to get a good education? They're not even born yet. That's a hint. Oh yeah, my eventual children. That's right. You can imagine the effect it will have upon your children if you get a good education. You want to let your children down? I mean, these are things that are individualized, that will come to pass when people realize how important school is. And also ask them, you're in high school right now. You have the most important job you'll ever have in your life. What is it? Getting, not going to school, not getting good grades, but getting an education. And there's so many students around the world, hundreds of thousands, millions of 17-year-olds that would give anything to have the opportunity that you have right now to get an education in the state of California or wherever you're from. And you're throwing it away. We have to have good individual, responsive, excellence in education in the United States of America. And we will ask Milwaukee if the parents are, what's the word again? Empowered to choose where that government money is going to be spent. It is a libertarian dream. Choice, responsibility, excellence. I have a motto. I'm off the subject, but I'm having a good time. My motto is, eschew mediocrity. Eschew mediocrity. Do not accept mediocrity in yourself, in your children, in your employees, in your government. Demand excellence. It's a way of life. It's an it's, it's approach to life. I know it's not reachable, but you can strive for it. We need to get excellence back in our schools. And this is the way it will happen. And we are the only game in town. We must help me. I don't know how to get this word out so much to the people that are in true need. By the way, there is another huge inequity in our world today. And that is, if I'm a parent and I am sending my child to a private school, I'm paying twice. I'm paying twice. I pay my property taxes, which then go into the public school system, and I'm also reaching into my pocket and paying tuition for the private education. By the way, you want to see a little hypocrisy? No, a lot of hypocrisy. I don't believe there are any members of Congress at all in Washington, D.C. that are sending their children to public schools. And it's not for a lack of spending money. Per capita, they're spending, as I understand it, more money in Washington, D.C. for the children than they are anywhere else in the country. And the results, by and large, are disastrous. Damn them. That's exactly what I mean to say. Hypocrisy is unacceptable. If you are in charge of Congress, if you are overseeing the city of Washington, D.C., and our schools are failing our children, and you won't send your children there, something is disastrously wrong, and it's your fault. Do something. We're going to do this. I believe it strongly. We have to get this word out. You can see there's going to be a charter school in Washington, D.C. By the way, there are now. 
poor, poor parents, parents that don't care. I tell you, boys, you probably know in Washington, D.C., they're lined up around the block. If they're going to open on Monday, they're starting to line up on Friday. They'll camp out to get their child to with that opportunity. Hispanics, for a long time, they have not valued education. I love Hispanics. I was in the Peace Corps in Costa Rica. Pedro Blar Espanol, como la gente. I love Hispanics. They're caring, they're family home. They have not valued education as well. They're starting to now. If you get some parents to do, it will have that coattail effect. Empower them to do this. It works. Yes. I'm glad you're here.
attract people because they will be excited too. Yes, I want excellence for the education of my child. And do you think that Donald Trump is going to help do that? Do you think Hillary Clinton is going to help do that? Not a chance in creation. It's a winning issue as well it should be. Politics is supposed to be responsive. Politicians are really, really good and effective at one thing, and that is followership, okay? They'll follow where the votes are, the votes are money. We need to get this word out. I'm doing what I can, but we have something here that is golden. It's an opportunity, and it put a smile on a lot of faces. Not too many gone. <coughs> yes? I have a question, because education's now been muddled up between the uh, federal level and the state level and local level and all of that. Um, on the national level, what would be, a, I guess, what would be the, a good way to go about doing that? Would you just try and get rid of the national spending on education, which a lot of people would be for? Or would it also be not a bad idea to do kind of like a block grant slash uh, you know, national school voucher system as a way of dealing with that? I think that was a planted question. <laughs> really good question. Look, we went for a long time until Jimmy Carter's era. We had no Department of Education at all. Were the schools better back then or are they better now? But we would eliminate these, the Department of Education. There is no need, oh no, there's no authorization for the federal government to be involved in education at all. End of discussion. There is such, but a more direct answer to your question, I would have a school voucher system wherein the federal government, because it's supporting education now, would take those monies and provide X dollars per capita per student, wherever they are around the country, and make this available. So we would take that provision to the, what is it, Department of Health, something in welfare, health, education and welfare. And we could have 20 people that would oversee the distribution of these vouchers. Now, as they get older, if they're in 11th grade and they're having chem labs and stuff like that, then the amount would be higher, but it's gonna be the same for every child. And then, will the wealthy have a better education? Hey, I'm sorry, folks, but the wealthy will always have more money, and if they wanna spend it in augment, bless them. Less them, but we will still have an amount of money that will provide that excellence through competition. And honestly, if there are special needs for your child, you know you have mental, physical disabilities, whatever, and it gets a little more into bureaucracy, but we'll make a, we'll make a provision for that as well. It's only fair. But yes, the federal government will do this per student. You can spend that and be the parents. What's that word again? empowerment to be able to make that choice. And the free market will respond. It will respond. It's good at responding. So that's my message. How we get this out, I don't know. I need all the help I can get. Yes. You have the answer, I understand, so yes. No, I don't. Uh, so you, you said something earlier about uh, trade schools and vocational schools. It, it seems like they went away for a while. Quite a while. How do we? Are they coming back? No, not at the moment. Will they under this program? They will flourish. Germany, like I did say before, is really flourishing. They don't have a lot of PhDs in economics in Germany, but they have a lot of people that get skills and trade. It works, and if there is that need, and the parents will see it a whole lot better than the than the government will. Trade school, if there's a need, trade schools will come back. Yes, sir. In Florida here and in North Carolina, we actually have a certain measure of school choice through charter schools. Through what? Charter schools. Oh, yes, indeed. And in that charter school system, exactly as you described, the moment they announce registration, the lines are around the block, and people are begging to win here in Florida. They call it winning the lottery, which is amazing at the proportion at which elected officials' children win the lottery. It's an amazing scenario for the board right <laughs> today. But, um, beyond that, what we look at is the amount of fund that they transfer over 
as they say, it's starving their system by taking money out of their system. Yes. Uh, it is such a, a, a small volume of money in comparison to the per capita spending of the system. So my children in a charter school uh, get $5,600 per capita to go to their charter school, at which point we have really low wages for those teachers. They're working on pigs. Meanwhile, the system is spending 10 grand per child and getting poor results. Yes. How do you see being able to address when we get those margins of choice, how we address the problem that it's at an unequal distribution? Yes, these are, you know, it's called growing pains, that uh, you take what you can get and, and then you build on it. I don't know, I, I, this isn't my field, I don't know what the numbers are in Washington, D.C., but I think it's somewhere around $8,000, $8,500 per child per year for education that we are now spending in schools. These are public schools and they're, and they're failing their children. I think that $5,600, if that's what you said, is not enough and it will, it will increase, but it's better than nothing. And, uh, and so once it starts working, what's the old saying, Katie, bar the door. It will, it will work. There's enormous pressure against it. And, and a lot of the teacher, man, teachers unions, they see a threat and they're right. Whenever any of us are having these conversations with other folks outside of sessions such as these, it's a, an important thing to recognize that people who've dedicated their lives to educating children, and particularly educating my children, are willing to accept lower wages to be unshackled from the system in order to educate my children. It's a calling. And the, 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 the response from the unions Response from the That's police, the the response from the firefighters, you're getting to asset forfeiture. Oh, you're attacking the police. You're attacking our, you know, you don't want, we're putting more officers on the, on the streets to save you. It's a crock. You may quote me on that. I can put it differently, but that's as good as I'll do at the moment. <laughs> it's politics. It's where the money is. We need people. I've said it before, politicians are really good at one thing, and that's followership. Once we see that the people are in favor of this, now we're getting, making real progress. Look at the Friedman Foundation, you can check them out on the, on the internet, and they'll show you the progress that we are making. So, hooray, it's not quite enough money, but in a lot of ways it's not a question of money, and it is not, it is not an attack on teachers. It is a support for good teachers. It is a calling and you will thrive under this system. Fewer shackles and if you know you're out there and all the rest of that sort of stuff and it isn't you bring in results, I don't care what your calling is and how dedicated you are, if it isn't working, you're gonna even have to modify it. And you know, teaching for the test, you know, this this course and all that sort of stuff. It's a bureaucracy. And then We've seen it. Some teachers will cheat on the answers to the test. Well, they almost have to to survive, you know, to show that they're, it just doesn't work. It's not education. We must come back to the education. And we are. We will. But it's going to be a whole lot faster because of the Libertarian Party and because of you. You care enough to be here. It must be of some interest to you. I think it's the most important issue other than everything else uh, in, the, in this upcoming election. We've got to get this word out. And if you have access, I go to Hispanic churches. I go to black churches. Think, you know, tell the ministers, tell the reverends, tell whomever, and, and their hierarchy, hey, help is on the way for your children. Henry Ford, not my favorite person socially, said something that everybody should have emblazoned upon their reality. And that is, anyone that feels that they can thrive by relying on the government should talk to the American Indian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's all you have to say. You think the government cares really about the education of your child? If they did, the schools would be keep getting better instead of worse. It's up to you. It's up to us. It's money, folks. Government is money. Government is power, and right now the power, the organized power, is with the unions. I think unions are fine for many reasons, but they should not run the ship. They are. 
It's us to start showing this. We're libertarians. We believe in liberty. We believe in responsibility. We believe in choice. By the way, Thomas Jefferson, this is way off the subject, but I love it. Thomas Jefferson, the epitome, in my opinion, of a libertarian, quoted by saying, look, I don't care if you worship one god, 20 gods, or no god. It doesn't pick my pocket, and it doesn't break my leg. Live and let live. And if you decide you don't want to send your children to a religious school, fine. Now, they're going to have some standards. I agree. You can have to teach reading, writing, arithmetic, and stuff like that. But if you want to do that, it's already been decided. Remember, we talked about the GI Bill. You are deciding to have this money spent on that school. Fine. But you're going to want to, not to have them you know, indoctrinated. You want them to be able to get an education to live in the world. It's your choice, and you're responsible for those choices. So that's where we are. It's an exciting time. And I'm appreciative of your being here. Unless there are more questions, that is my view. And uh, it's just an exciting thing. And we will make that change that our country and our children and our parents really do want. We're it. We are the ones that are going to bring this about. Let's get it done. Thank you. Thank you.